Lesson number four, what we must teach our daughters. We left off last week. We started with 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We have built the foundation now of marriage, and we're still talking about marriage. Preparing our daughters for marriage. And verses 1 through 5. Now concerning the things where he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. These lessons are number four. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife has not power over her body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband has not power of, over, power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, except to be for consent for a time, that ye may give yourself to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempts you not for your incontinence. That's marriage. That's a sexual relationship that is being discussed. That's the lesson previous to this lesson. Now Hebrews 13, 4. Hebrews 13, 4, we've read already. <coughs> marriage is honorable. In all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. God says, marriage is honorable. We, to teach our children, our daughters, honor thy mother and father. God has a honor for the husband and wife called marriage. Honor of mother and father to a child moves from the parent to the marriage bed upon marriage. When a man or a woman gets married, the honor of the parents, the rules of the parents, are now moved to the marriage. It's now husband and wife. And what is honorable now is the bed. It's what God said. <laughs> Marriage happens and the parents are out. We must teach our teenage daughters that the marriage bedroom door is closed unless a serious emergency. There is a do not disturb mom and dad. The husband and wife. Because disturbing the husband and wife in the marriage bed will disrupt what God honors. And one of the things is children honor your, your, father, your mother and your father is when they are together, you honor them with peace, quiet. And no interruptions. Interrupting will break the honor of mother and father. We saw in chapter 7 of the Corinthians marriage. And the marriage bed is not sin. The bed is undefiled. We must teach our daughters. That bedroom with her husband. And only her husband. And only her husband is allowed in there. If I can say it's sacred without getting religious. But all to have a religious tone that holiness, purity, nobody else is allowed in that room but the spouse. The husband and wife in bed, there is no sin. There is no wickedness. There is no judgment. We must teach our daughters. S sex is not a sin when it's marriage. We must teach our daughters sex before marriage is fornication. Sex after marriage with someone who is not your spouse is adultery. We need to teach them that too. We need to teach them adultery, fornication, and the marriage bed. It's not polluted and it's honorable. 
whoremongers, lewdness, lust, fornication, adultery. That's not something we want to get our daughters into. That's something we want to pull our daughters away from. The state of the bedroom, according to the Bible. Husband and wife, there's no judgment. Whoredom, there's judgment. Adultery, there's judgment. Whatever happens behind the bedroom door of a husband and wife, whatever happens, God says it's honorable. He said, well, he wants to do this or she wants to do that. What did Hebrews 13, 4 say? That is you. That is you and your husband. That is you and your husband. That is you and your wife. Uh, that is a relationship that you have with no other and you're not to have with no other. Nowhere in the Bible does it come to take the marriage bed with anybody else but your spouse. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life for salvation. Your spouse is the only one to be in that marriage bed. So back to 1 Corinthians 7. <clears throat> and my throat is allergy, so please forgive me. Verse 6. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. Paul has no command for what he's going to say now. And to whom would Paul acquire such approval? Who would Paul want to get his permission to speak from? Paul. He get it from God. So he sought God. He said, before I write what I'm going to write, God, can I write this? God did not command it. God said, Paul did it. I want you to write this down. God said, Paul, can I write this? I mean, Paul said to God, can I write this down, God? And God's like, okay, go ahead. But what Paul's writing is not a command of God. It's permission by God. For I would that all men were even as I myself. For every man has his perfect, has his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. So, Paul was either whittled or unmarried. We don't know. I have not learned in my lessons what he is. So, when Paul says, I like men to be as myself, the main subject is not married. But, But, every man has a proper gift of God. Paul says, I would love to have every man to remain unmarried. But, marriage is a gift of God as Jesus Christ is the gift of God. As children are a heritage of the Lord. A marriage... Paul says, i like to have you stay single, but marriage is a gift of God. With Paul's opinion to be unwed, marriage is of God. Proper gift. Gift receiving is optional. Not everybody is forced to receive a gift. I can offer you a gift. You don't have to take it. I try to spend every week going down, preaching on the streets and giving gospel tracts out. People, the, the gift of God, Jesus Christ. Most will not receive that gift. Gift is never forced. So Paul's not forcing his opinion. By saying gift, by saying but, it's an option. But if you were to ask my opinion, I'd rather have you stay unmarried, but it's a gift. You can receive a gift if you like. And warning, some gifts are given to deceive or cause fraud. I'm not saying that's what marriage is. But... Isn't there a lot of marriages out there that have failed, destroyed, ruined? 
Are you going to say that's a gift of God? You're going to tell me that a woman who's saved marries an unsaved God? That's a gift of God? You're going to tell me a guy who's saved who marries an unsaved woman? That's a gift of God? As in the days of Lot, as in the days of Noah, they're given in the marriage. That's been going on since Adam and Eve marriage. Eight. I say therefore to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them, even if they abide, even as I. And there he goes again. Guidance by Paul is, hey, stay single. Remain unmarried. He says that twice, right after saying that marriage is the gift of God. He's developed don't get married sandwich. Here's the bread on the bottom. Remain as I am. All right. Marriage is a gift. And then to the single and to the unmarried, to the widows, remain as I. But if they cannot contain... more meat on top of the sandwich let them marry for it is better to marry than to burn now this is not hell and they cannot contain what what is the subject on that it is good for a man not to touch a woman verse one nevertheless to avoid fornication let every man have his own wife let every woman have her own husband if you can't keep yourselves away from sexual matters you're going to burn in lust remember what we said earlier marriage takes away fornication Paul is saying, listen, if you can't contain yourself, you can't keep yourself, you've got this burning desire. Oh, I'm just on fire for you, babe. Flames of love. I burn for you. My heart burns for you. If you can't contain yourself, get married. And to marry just for sex it's very unwise and stupid. And that's not what Paul is saying. Paul wouldn't say, hey, get married just to have sex. That, that would not be what Paul would, would tell us to do. <coughs> not to study this entire chapter and find it be wrong. That's not the advice Paul would give. It would be great consideration who you're going to marry. There's more to marriage than sex. 2 Samuel 13, 2. 2 Samuel 13, 2. I'm not going to read the whole story. I'm just going to read part, parts of it. 13, 2. And Amon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin, and Amon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. Verse 4. And he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Yeah, I'm so sick of love, I'm so, I want to be with her. Wilt thou tell me? And Amon said, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. 14. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and laid with her rape. You say, what's that have to do with marriage? It's nothing. But here's this guy, he's in love with this woman. Hey, oh, my, 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 my. I, you know, I've got to have her. I'm, I'm, I'm having desire. I am burning with love, baby, for this woman. So I'm going to take her. I'm going to have sex with her. I'm going to marry her so I, I can just have sex with her. 15 and she said to him there is no cause this evil this evil is sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst to me 
but he was not hearkening unto her. And 15. Oh, 15, excuse me, I read it. And Amon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherein he hated her was greater than the love wherein he had for her. Oh, well, we're just going to get married because Paul says we're, we're burning in loving desire of, oh, baby, baby, baby. You may find out that that love ain't love. And then you're married. Now what are you going to do? Divorce? That's not scriptural. Needs getting married just to have sex. This sex is self-lusty and it's never love. It is not the love of God. The love of God is not to get someone into the sack. The love of God is not rock and roll. The love of God is not, hey baby, you know, if you really love me. The love of God is not here, babe. I'll, get, I'll buy you some drinks and see where we wake up in the morning. We've got to warn our daughters of these tactics by men. But it's lust of the flesh. That's Satan. We need to teach our daughters that if, if this man is only interested to sleep with her, that is not the love of God. That is the hatred and flesh and self of Satan and the flesh. There is no charity in a sex-driven marriage. It's all for me, myself, and I. And we've talked about that last time. Sexual intercourse is never promised as a lifelong event. We're going to get married just because of sex, as Paul said, at least we burn and, you know, prevent fornication. We're going to say, I do. You're full. Change of life may make it unable to have sex any longer. What are you going to do then? Medical conditions may end your sex life at any time. What are you going to do? Where's your marriage now? Accidents. You can have an accident. Sex life gone. Now what? Now you got the boo hoo hoos and I hate you. Second Samuel thirteen. How many marriages do you know are like that? Shotgun weddings, isn't that what it's called? No, it's called fornicating weddings. That should have never happened in the first place. If your marriage is based upon sex and the sex stops, what is your marriage now? Tell me. If it's based upon love, the love will be there all through. Matter of fact, if a marriage is based on love and you've got trials and changes in life, medical conditions, you got accidents, the love becomes strong. Stronger. Strongest. I've been married twice. My first wife died in my arms of cancer. And what you realize, true love hurts. When you are there sitting on the other side of the hospital bed, and then you're in a hospital bed and your spouse is sitting there, and there's absolutely nothing you can do, and then there's no sex going on, what are you going to do then? A true relationship has to be on love. Sex needs to be taught, comes after I do, starts the honeymoon night. And when the honeymoon night starts, we ought to teach our daughters that she is to be in her purest form. The greatest gift our daughters can give to our sons-in-law is their virginity. And clean, pure thoughts. That starts in the home. Study the roles of women, the wife. She is not a sex slave in the Bible. The Bible never points a woman as a sex slave. Like food and appetite, man must control his appetite. Supposed to be marrying a man, 
not a little baby who somebody in the Corinth church the Corinth church asked Paul about getting married 7-1 and we are reading his response 7 1 through 9 someone who is not married 7 10 to 16 to the married 7 10 now we're going to get some grounds here we're getting some grounds and we got to lay for our daughters this is not preach every sunday morning and it's not going to be you'll be lucky if you hit this one in three years in a church and you may get under a preacher who teaches it wrong father it is your job to train your children in the lord you see how far we get unto the married i command paul commanding seven six was not a command 710 is a command. You can be married or not married. Okay. Command. Yea, not I. Paul saying, this is not me commanding, but the Lord. God has now stepped. Okay, Paul, your opinion. Now, let's say what God, thus saith the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. God said that. No departure from the union of marriage. When departure from the union is called civil war. We've got to teach our daughters that when she enters the union of marriage, there's no departure. It's permanent. It's supposed to be permanent. And when we put into our doors that it is permanent, she should think in her head with your prayers. I better think very wisely. We need to teach her how to think wisely because she's a young child. She don't know any better. Read Proverbs. My son, tain unto my wisdom. My son, tain unto my instruction. Get that which I, I and your mother teach you. I'll hide hold of it. They don't come with... Listen, when a child is born, they don't come with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge as an option. You got to search it. You got to get it. You got to teach them it. They got to think, hey, if this thing is a lifelong commitment, I better make the right decisions. God said that. But, and if she depart, oh, let her remain unmarried. And be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife she does leave she is to remain unmarried reconcile the friendship with her husband separation is a legal Bible fact this is what this is this is a separation It's time away. Depart means to move out. My husband abuses me. What do I do? You move out, but you don't get a divorce. You seek time and reconciliation. What if he doesn't really reconcile? What if he doesn't want to get right? You just stay away. You remain unmarried. That's what the Bible says. My spouse drives me crazy. I need to leave. Then leave. But don't get a divorce. Separation. Then reconciliation. Sometimes, hey, you may have to have a cooling off. You may have to get away. But you don't get a divorce. You come back. To put away. Is divorce he tells the husband don't put her away she leaves 
don't divorce her. Look at Matthew 5.31. Matthew 5.31. It has been said, Whoso shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Put it away is divorcement. God told Paul through the Holy Spirit, write down, she leaves, you don't get a divorce. Put away is to get rid of. Genesis 35, 2, Exodus 12, 15. You gotta be careful what we what we say to our children. Put away your toys. That's they're not getting rid of their toys, they're just cleaning up their room. So we gotta watch how we use the Bible words. So when the preacher gets up and preaches about putting it away, you're gonna think, oh, that's just put my toys back where they belong. That's not the Bible term. Put in a way with, with Genesis 35, 2, Exodus 12, and Matthew 5 means you you get rid of it. And God says, no, divorce is not ever the answer. Paul said, God said reconciliation. Jesus said it was granted for the hardness of your heart. You don't want to re 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 uh, reconcile. You don't want to get right. You just want to end it. You just want to cut it out. That's why God wrote the divorce in there. You just don't want to hang it out. Adultery is God's bounds for divorce, Jesus said. The only grounds that Jesus laid for divorce is adultery. Stepping out on your spouse. Unfaithfulness. Untrustworthy. Disobeying your vows and in that case god jesus christ said that's it the marriage is done now if you want to reconciliate and you want to get right god bless you go for it it brings a broken union and a civil war in the family mistrust unfaithfulness and hurt 7 12 but to the rest speak i not the lord <laughs> Paul's going back. This is Paul speaking now. See, God gave us a little 10 and 11. God's, okay, Paul, write this down. I say it. Paul says to the rest, speak I, but not the Lord. If any brother have a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. All right, brother, a saved Christian. 711 unsaved 712 saved a saved man married his wife is lost she's not saved spouse gets saved after the marriage has begun if the wife is content to live with the Christian no separation either or either who no divorce she wants to be married to you she wants to stay married with you though you want to serve Christ and good praise God for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife verse 14 and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. It's a lost husband or the saved wife, vice versa. Saved husband or lost wife. Sanctified is set apart. God sets apart the lost spouse by the saved spouse. And this is not, I'm saved, I'm going to get married to a lost person marriage. Because we are told definitely later on, a saved person is to marry a saved person. This is an event, you've got two unsaved people and someone gets saved after the marriage. And how or what does God separate the unsaved spouse? I have no idea. And it's not the saving grace kind of salvation. 
It's not that God, you know, they're saved because now you can't get saved for your spouse. That's up to them. But God somehow separates the unsaved spouse because of the saved spouse. Verse 15. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. And what a mouthful of a verse. You got a lost spouse. You got saved. Spouse does not like it. They depart. The unsaved leaves or forces the saved person out. Go ahead and leave. Go ahead, let them leave. The separation, the, sanctific the sanctification, the set apart or holiness is gone from the unsaved person. In verse 14, the family was set apart for God by the Christian. Now that the lost person, the unsaved, breaks the vows, God is gone from them, the unsaved. And when God says the marriage between the saved and the lost, God says that's bondage, slavery, being in shackles, the ball and chain. And if they are or were to depart or to get rid of the same person, God says that departure is peace. What are you going to do with that verse? God said, okay, the unsaved wants to stay with the saved person who just got saved. I'm going to sanctify that marriage. I don't want to be married to you. I've had it with you. Get out or I'm leaving. God says, okay, my sanctivity leaves that person. You are no more under bondage. You are now free. Paul lays out single, widow, Marriage, saved and saved, saved and unsaved. Earnest. Uh, earnest. And those are brother and sister. They're saved. And I'm looking for earnest. I got a note here about earnest. Earnest two saved spouses will not pursue withdrawal, separation, or even a divorce. It's not even thought of in chapter 7. Paul gives us the condition. you got a saved spouse and a lost spouse. It may not be compatible. It may not work out. It may. It may not. But as far as two saved Christians... Paul never writes, hey, if the saved departs from the saved. No, it's just you're supposed to be together. You're supposed to stay together. There is to be no separation. You are married. You are joined in the Lord. Seek not to be gone. Seek not to depart. Taken for granted by Paul. For one or the other to seek a breach of vows, the union of God-ordained marriage, there is something wrong with the behavior of one or both the Christians in that marriage. What are we to teach our daughters? Marriage is binding. To death do us part are not just words. God takes it very serious. 725. 725. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord. Okay, Paul. God didn't tell me this. I'm going with my personal opinion again. Yet I give my judgment. As one that has obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. A virgin of a person who has no sexual activity. Make sure that's your daughter. Honeymoon is 
Oh, the honeymoon. If you were not a virgin on that special night, <coughs> you were a fornicating sinner. Prevent your daughter from being a fornicating sinner. I was one. I'm sorry I ever did not hold off to the honeymoon night. Paul is speaking by permission again and not by God's commandment. The judgment here, he says, it, it's his opinion. Opinion is a judgment. Judge not least you be judged. Well, what you're telling me what you think is judging. Paul is the most skilled man to give us his opinion on the relationship and fellowship of the work of the Holy Spirit and with God. God entrusted him with the church, age, books, and doctrine. I think we can take Paul's opinion. And listen, I'm not the Paul I, you know, whatever Paul says, that's what we must do. I believe in all 66 books all together. But Paul more so for the church age. But I'm not raising Paul up on a pedestal. I raise the Lord Jesus Christ. 26. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress, I say. That is good for a man to be present, the time of his writing, the distress, the events, the current events. Christians were being persecuted, murdered, tortured, driven out, confiscated. Christians were surfaced. Christians were getting persecuted at this time. It's not a great time to think about marriage. Uh, Corinth, you guys are being persecuted. The, the emperor in Rome is, is killing us. He's lighting us and having us the light of his parties and all that. This is not the real good time to be thinking about getting married. It's good for a man so to be a virgin, 725. Paul urges again, be single, 27. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loose. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. Bound, tied or not, marriage. Some people call it the ball and chain, her leash. No, you're tied or not, you're bound. No loose. Don't seek to be freed. Aren't you loose from a wife? Remain single, unmarried. Remember she left? Don't put her away. Stay unmarried. 728. But and if thou marry, uh oh. Are you loose from a wife? Seek not a wife, but if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. S I N N E D. All right, next classification. If a virgin marry, she has not. S I N N E D. Let's stop there for a minute before we get to the next point. A guy has been loose from a wife, don't get married. But if she's left you and you've gotten married, someone won't agree with what I just said. That's tough. That's what the Bible says. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. But, conjunction, conjunction, that but goes with the previous sentence. If thou marry, thou hast not sinned. You're 19 years old, male or female. You get married. Your spouse takes off on you, leaves you. You're telling me if you live to 70, let's say 20, 20 years old, so I can do the math. You're telling me for 50 years you're supposed to... Really? You can't get married because you're married, so you can't go get a woman. Now you're committing adultery. You can't go buy it because that's whoredom.
A Virgin Mary, she has not sinned. That's not the Virgin Mary. That's Virgin M-A-R-R-Y. There is no sin in marriage, Paul just said. After saying several times, I would rather have you not marry, but it is marriage is not a sin, though a church teaches, oh, you're supposed to be not married, you're supposed to be celibacy, married to Jesus Christ. You're a liar. They are a liar. And if you're bringing your daughter in that mess kind of a church, get them out, get you out, and get you in a Bible-believing church. You are to teach your daughter marriage is not a sin. But we are to teach our daughters when it comes to marriage. The greatest Christian in the Bible said, I'd rather you not. But if you do, you've not sinned. <clears throat> 728. Shall have trouble in the flesh, I spare you. I think this is where we're going to end. Okay? Adultery is sin. Got to teach our children that. Adultery is sin. See where we were. <coughs> That's not being taught today. You need to teach it. We need to teach fornication is a sin. But marriage is not a sin. Hebrews 13 4, marriage like Jesus Christ is God approved. Now, what's the troubles he talks about in this verse, real quick? What is he saying about troubles with marriage? The husband and wife are going to fight. Fights will happen. Arguments will come. you got two people, and you're not going to have a peaceful life together all the days you're being married. Paul says, I spare you. Avoid the troubles. You're going to get married. You're going to have fights. You're going to have disagreements. You're going to have arguments. I spare you. Stay single. That's what... Isn't it what Paul been saying all along? Almost like Paul was already married. And that's, I'm not criticizing marriage when I say that. It's just, it happens. Paul is speaking to a group of Christians, hey, like they're young, like our teenagers. It can cause troubles. This is not the time. We're in tribulations. We're in future persecution. This is not the right time, but it's a gift of God. It's not a sin if you do. And if you're really mad and passionately in love with that person and you just can't do without that person, you have not sinned if you married it. But if you can contain, if you can withhold your passion and serve the Lord, which we'll get into afterwards, serve the Lord. But if you marry, it's not a sin. That's what we're learning now. Marriage is not a sin. Adultery, shacking up, a little fling is a sin. Fornication, premarital sex is a sin. We got to teach our teenage daughters what sin is and to avoid sin at all costs.